Well, good morning and welcome to Real Life Church. I'm Pastor Bob and I'm glad that you're here this morning. We have a brand new teaching series on tap. We're excited about it, but I can't begin it yet. And you know why? Because you haven't shared this video. That's what I'm asking you to do. Share this video with your friends right now. Right here on the bottom of the screen is a QR code and that's gonna let you know what's going on in the life of Real Life Church. Like I said, brand new teaching series called Snapshot, Jesus in Focus. We're specifically going to look at the life of Jesus from the time that he stepped out into the pages of history as an adult until he was ultimately crucified and rose from the dead. We are going to look at some of his significant conversations, some of his significant encounters, and a lot of his significant teachings. We're going to go from him being a teacher to the world, ultimately going on to be a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Some of the things that we're going to introduce, well, they're going to be new to you. Hopefully, they're radically going to change the way you view Jesus, the way you think about Jesus. There are so many different ideas of who Jesus is and what he did, and I hope that you're going to get something because we're going to be here for several weeks looking at just the life of Jesus Christ. When you read about Jesus in the Gospels, it couldn't be any clearer. Jesus came into this world to introduce something that was completely brand new. He did not come to extend something that was old. He didn't simply come to complete the Bible so that we would have both an Old Testament and a New Testament. He brought something brand new to the world, and not just for the world, but for the world. Every headliner, okay, needs a warm-up act. Somebody to come out and get the crowd war ready and warmed up. Interesting enough, Jesus had a warm-up act. From the Jordan River, draped in animal skins, with locust breath, please welcome, you got it, John the Baptist. He was the opening act for Jesus. Now, I all know that you've heard of John the Baptist, and the reason he was called John the Baptist is not because he was Baptist or he was Methodist or Presbyterian or anything else like that. As far as we can tell, John was the first person to ever manhandle another person to baptize them. See, baptism at this point in the first century, well, it was part of a multifaceted process that a non-Jewish person would go through to become Jewish. There was a meal, there were certain rituals that you had to go through, then the act of becoming a Jewish person was becoming a part of their covenant, you had to be baptized. And baptism was a ceremonial washing where you decided that you were dying to your Gentileness and you were alive to your Jewishness. You would have done this alone and no one would have actually been touching you when you did this. Yet John the Baptist comes to the Jordan River and he begins to physically baptize people. And he got a nickname, John the Baptist, or better yet, John the the baptizer. Now, you know there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to look at a lot of them, okay? But I want you to notice the detail here in Luke's representation of this Gospel. And I love that he writes this detail because it gives us and it should reassure us that the things that Luke writes are accurate and true. Luke begins this Gospel by saying that he has thoroughly investigated all of these things and he puts them in chronological order for us. I want you to read with me from chapter three, just the first couple verses, because I want you to note the detail because it means something to us this morning. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was a tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip was the tetrarch of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis. Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. This is extraordinary that what Luke is saying, you skeptics out there, fact check me. Go ahead. This is when it happened. He goes on and he says, this is not once upon a time or in a galaxy far, far away or give you some place that you've never heard of. What Luke is doing is he's setting the stage for actual, factual history. 
He says, let's start on the macro. Let's go with the emperor of Rome and what year. And then the governors of Judea and Galilee and the high priests and all of this. There is no vagueness, nothing to be interpreted and no confusion. And this is what happened. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah. In the wilderness, people went out from Jerusalem and all of Judea into the region of the Jordan River. Now, if you continue in the Gospels, John the Baptist came to witness and testify. Look with me at this verse here from John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. It says, He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. John is the witness. He is the, what did I say? The warm-up act, okay, for the one that is coming. And he's got a message. And I want you to see what his message is. He said, John testified, this is in verse 15, same chapter, testified about him and cried out, saying, this was he, now watch this, of whom I said, he who comes after me and has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, you may not know that John the Baptist and Jesus were kind of somewhat related. Um, they knew of each other. This was not their first introduction together. And John the Baptist is actually older than Jesus. And what's so surprising about this is John says that, the, first of all, Jesus is going to be higher ranking than him, and he existed before me. Well, how did he exist before him? Because he's God, okay? And he's been around since the beginning. Um, and John recognized it. And in this moment, I want you to think about this. John the Baptist knows who Jesus is. And Jesus and John somehow make some type of eye contact. And in this next very moment, the encounter between these two people are going to change the world forever. It's going to be the moment that Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, is going to step into history and he's going to begin his ministry. And things are never going to be the same. Now, whether you're a religious person or whether you're a Christian or not, maybe you're part of another religion, here's the one undeniable, well, fact that's never going to change. We're never going back. It's going to change how people relate to God forevermore. I love this. It comes from verse 29. It says that John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him and said, I want you to listen to this word, behold. I like the word look. I don't use behold very much anymore. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. See, John invites his audience, the people that were there, the people to be baptized for the repentance of sins. And he invites them to look at Jesus. And he says, the Lamb of God. And every Jewish person would have known what he was talking about. They would have gone back to when God provided the Lamb for Abraham. And John the Baptist uses the same language, look the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You mean Jewish sin? The sins of our enemies? Is this what John the Baptist is saying? They had to be thinking because they had done so much in years leading up to Jesus. We're talking about centuries leading up to Jesus of separating themselves from the world. They didn't eat their food. They didn't wear their clothes. They didn't marry their daughters. They didn't go to their homes. I mean, if you were to go to the temple, they wouldn't be allowed inside certain ports of the temple because they were, well, they were sinners. And yet the Lamb of God is coming to take away the sins of the entire world. And this moment is going to change all all of religion and all of church and its viewpoints for an eternity. And that tension right there, Jesus stepping into the limelight, 
creates a huge conflict for those back then, well, and even creates a conflict for a lot of people today. See, Jesus was bridging the covenant between two value systems, the bridge between two sets of laws and commandments and two different worldviews. There was Moses and God and Abraham and all of that. And then there was going to be Jesus. And there was a transition that was about to take place. And old ways die hard. And those who profit the most, well, they're going to be the ones that want the status quo to stay the same. And when Jesus shows up, it's going to be difficult. People are not going to like it. He's going to destroy the whole temple system, the religious leaders, and not just for a few days or for hours, but he is changing the way people see God forever. The end was now, and the new was ahead. A brand new covenant, a brand new arrangement between God and mankind, between God and you, and he came to replace the old with the new. From Exodus to Malachi, everything new, completely different, no longer valid. John the Baptist understood that he must what? Decrease and Jesus must increase. And he baptized Jesus right there in the Jordan River. And there it is. God's promise to Abraham would finally be fulfilled. A man who came as a lamb to take away the sins of the world, to be able to do all of that. But before we get there, there are sermons to preach. There are stories to tell. There are diseases to heal. There are crowds to feed. Well, there's even some tables to topple. And why did Jesus do all that? Because he wanted his audience to know one thing for sure. God was up to something new for you, for me, and the entire world. Jesus on the scene with John the Baptist. Where are you at this morning? Has God done something new in your life? Jesus wants to do a new work in your life. He wants to actually take all the old and, well, he wants to get rid of it. He wants to give you a new life in Christ Jesus. And if you've not done that, man, today is the perfect day to do it. You can confess your sin to God right where you're at. You can ask Jesus to be your savior right where you're at. And if you're interested in doing that, or if you've got questions in doing that, would you maybe text me or email me at bob at reallifeyuma.com? I would love to be able to help you in that journey. That's why Real Life Church exists, to see people be transformed by Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. God, thanks for our time together. Thank you again for Jesus. Thank you that we're telling his story. And God, thank you so much that when he did come onto the scene with John the Baptist and he introduced a new way, a relationship way to have communion with him. And God, I'm grateful for that. I pray, Father, your blessings on those that are listening. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope that you've been listening. I hope you got something. All right. And I'll see you back next week. Thank you.